Began in Jerusalem, once they professed faith in Christ, the, the Jewish leaders cracked down on them. Their, their fellow men start making fun of them, and, and they just they scatter. And they go all the way from Rome all the way to India. And so these Jewish Christians are all over the Middle East. He's writing to them. And he's writing to encourage them. These you have to understand these Jewish Christians, wherever they landed in the Middle East or all over in India or to Rome, they would have been outsiders. They would have been the lower class. They would have been uneducated. They would have been the blue collar workers of the day. And he's writing to them and he's just saying, I understand how tough life is. I understand the hardships you're going through. And here he says, are any of you suffering? Pray. And I think this is applicable to us today. When life seems to be tough, when life crumbles down around you and you don't understand what's going on, pray. In, and so, the, it's really two parts of this first verse. Are you, are, is life going badly? Pray. The second part is this. On the other end of the spectrum, is life going well? Praise His name. So, you can, we can have this suffering that exists at the hands of other people. Whenever they persecute us, whenever they, they beat us down, or we can we can have these sufferings that exist through life circumstances, such as you know harsh working conditions or conflict in the home or or friends who turn their backs. Whatever it is, those sufferings pray on the other end of the spectrum when life is going well. Praise His name. You know this is interesting. We just sang five songs. For some of you, it was an eternity. For some of you, couldn't get enough of it. The early church. You want uh, this? Take this. This is the early church. This is within thirty years or less of Jesus' crucifixion. Notice the church is a singing church. Music and singing and offering up praises and hymns. It's in our DNA. This isn't something that's come about in the last 30, 50, 100 years. The Christian church has always been praying. Always has been singing. It's in our DNA. What we do up here on Sunday mornings is just, is just a glimpse into what you're going to experience in heaven. Notice that even the angels, holy, 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 all the time. Here is, is just more evidence that as a church, we need to be engaged in offering up praises to the Lord. Not just, church isn't just me opening up God's Word and, and reading it and interpreting it and giving you three points in a poem. It's much more than that. Church is us coming together and, and acknowledging how great He is. It's, it's us taking us off of the throne and saying, God, we're going to put you back in your rightful place. And so, here the very first, James is saying, when life is bad, pray. And, and by the way, the word he uses there for pray is don't just pray once. It's a continuous, ongoing, constant prayer. And then the second part of it is this. Praise his name. Sing songs of praise. Lift him up. You know, I, I really think whenever I begin to think about this, we don't do this well. I mean, how often do you praise or sing worship? How often do you worship his name outside of what we do here on Sunday mornings? I want to encourage you this. Get, get you some worship music. Keep it in your car. When you drive, pop that thing in. Praise His name when you're going down the road. So offer up hymns to Him. It's a great time to pray. What, why don't we pray more? I, I mean, think about this. When do we engage in prayer the most often? It's when things get hard, isn't it? It's kind of... I, have you ever heard anybody say, well, there's nothing else to do but pray? 
That's, that's a fallacy to begin with. You should begin with prayer, not end with prayer. We are to be a people who are actively engaging with God the Father. You, you realize that's a privilege. We have the privilege of going to the throne of the Creator of the universe and communing with Him one-on-one. -on -one. So it's, it's almost like if I had a direct line to the President and I never picked up the phone except if I needed it. What a shame. What a waste of a resource. Let's be people of song and prayer in the good times and the bad. Praise and celebrate. And so here's the first truth that comes out of this first verse in 13. Authentic faith expresses itself through prayer regardless of life circumstance. That's the first thing we see about authentic faith here as we wrap it up. Look at verse 14. Now, as we read this, let me just... Uh, this is a very controversial verse right here. Whole denominations have been built off of this verse. Whole Christian movements have been built off this. Have you ever seen a, a Benny Hinn revival? Have you ever seen those? If you if never have, go to YouTube and just, just put his name in, Benny Hinn. He's the guy that will just walk up to somebody and do that and they'll fall over in, in healing. Okay? There have been whole movements based off of this. Look at what it says. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, so let's do this. Before we take this verse and, and try to talk about it and what it means, I, I think what we need to do is we read, need to read it in context. Don't ever read a, a verse and pull it out and say, look, this is how God works. Let's, I mean, read it through context because there's something deeper going on here, especially if it's confusing or, or you really don't completely understand what it means. Let me read through this and, and then we'll come back to it. Look at verse 15 again. Or 14. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you, and if you have committed any sins, you will have been forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now that we've read it in context, I want you to see a few things. Number one, he uses this word sick. Are any of you sick? That word sick, when, when you look at it, the original interpretation, what the word means, it really means weak or feeble. Sick, to me, is more than just being weak or feeble. There's symptoms that go along with an illness, right? So, whenever they interpret that as weak or feeble, it leaves it open to interpretation. A lot of Christian pastors and commentators take verses like this and they take that meaning and then they try to, uh, try to extrapolate what that really is referring to. So some people, when they, it, most people have said it really means sick and we'll go with that. When you think about the interpretations of sick, here's two main interpretations that have come out of that. The first one is this. It's a spiritual weakness, not a physical illness. That's one of the very first interpretations a lot of Christian pastors and theologians come up with. They, they read this in context, this whole verse in context, and they say this is pointing to a weariness or, and due to a weakness of the soul. These are, remember who he's talking to, he's talking about two. Those who are persecuted, those who have been oppressed, he's been talking to them. those that have been scattered, those that have been minimalized, marginalized. He's talking about people who are experiencing life's troubles, people who have experienced grief. That's what he's that's that's the audience he's talking to. So obviously this isn't a physical illness, this is a spiritual illness. That's the first interpretation. Okay, the second interpretation is this. 
that it is a physical illness. So there's both ends of the spectrum here. There's not a whole lot of, of common ground or, or common understanding. You'll see it on both ends of the spectrum. Even in the Baptist theologians will land on either side of the spectrum. But many, and I'm going to land on this particular one right here, on the second one, that it's a physical weakness or illness, most likely. Because notice what it says. It says, are any of you sick? Then what's he tell them to do? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Notice it says, call for the elders of the church. So this gives the impression to me that this person is physically incapable of going to the elders. He calls for them. Obviously, this person is bedridden or doesn't feel well enough to go to the elders and, and speak to them. So, I, I, I think that it's a physical illness because it's, it's, it's incapacitated somebody. But, I want you to see another truth that kind of comes out of this. Whose responsibility is it to, to announce and communicate that they're ill? It's the person who's sick. I, I don't have ESP, y'all. If you're ill, if you're sick, if you're hospitalized, if something has happened in your life, you have to tell me. Call the church. Leave a message. Shoot me a text. Email me. Have a friend call me. The only way that we know, and this is going right back to the early church, the only way that the leadership within the church knows what's going on in your life and can pray for you is if you let them know. And my former job, we had people that would make big deals out of the fact that, you know, the pastor didn't come and see me. The pastor didn't come and pray for me. They had never contacted the church. Nobody had told us. We didn't know. The onus is on the ill. That's where the burden is placed. Notice the second thing here. It says, call for the elders of the church to come and pray for you. And then look at the second one. Anointing you with oil. What's the purpose of the oil? Have you ever considered that? I... Uh, several years ago, we had someone in, in my former church that was very, very, very ill. I mean, we're talking critically, gravely ill. Basically had been sent home to die. And they called for the, the church leadership, the church staff went to that home. Along with the deacons, and that person asked us to anoint them with oil and pray for them. I'm thinking, you know how I am, I'm going, oh, that's a little creepy. I don't know how I feel about this. It's scriptural, number one. But number two, what's the purpose of the oil? Why do that? Some people say it's symbolic. Some people, some theologians, some commentators, they point out that this is, this is uh, an oil. They anoint them because oil at that time had medicinal purposes. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Where... where where the, the person had been jumped by robbers and they had been beaten, what does the Samaritan do? Tends to their wounds with oil. So some people believe that it's a, somewhat of a lotion. It could be used for dry skin or, or to soothe wounds, the pain in wounds. Here's the point in, in all of this. I, don't, I think it was probably used as some sort of medicinal purposes. But the point of all this, don't get bogged down in the details. Don't build a denomination or a, or, a, uh, or a religious movement based on this verse. Take the point here. Be wise about this. When someone is sick, believers are to come alongside one another. And we are to minister by praying for them and, and making sure that their needs are met. That's what this verse means. Come alongside one another. See that their needs are met. The oil, that's the physical need. The prayer, that's the spiritual need. As a community of believers, 
Authentic faith looks like this. We come together and care for one another. Authentic faith is exhibited when we care for the physical and spiritual needs of one another. Don't get bogged down in the details or, or think that there's some sort of magic incantation here. If you get an elder to come to your bedside and pray for you and anoint you, that everything's going to be okay. Let's go on. Look at verse 15. So such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And so this is really the confusing, controversial part. And it leads us to this question. Can sick believers expect physical healing through the prayers of the elders? Is, can we expect that? If I'm ill, if I have a, a kidney disease, can I expect, because God's Word says this, that if, if I call for the elders and they come and they pray over me and they anoint me with oil, can I expect physical healing? Well, let's go back. Think about what we read in context. You, we, we look at verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You, there's two types of sickness that are explained in the Bible. And that first type of sickness is often the result of just being in a broken and fallen world. I mean, things like cancer. Those things happen. It's, it, we experience sickness, not necessarily because we have been particularly sinful. We haven't done anything. It's just, it's in our DNA. It's part of be, living in this world. And Adam and Eve fractured the world when sin came in. And so, sometimes you just get sick. Most of the time, the illnesses that we see and that our loved ones experience and that we experience is just the result of living in a broken world. But there's also a second type of illness. And this is an illness that is a direct result, has a direct relationship with personal sin and sickness. I, I, not, this is always true. Not always true. But in certain circumstances, certain situations, Sin can cause sickness. Remember, Jesus had the same conversation with his disciples back in John chapter 9. And Jesus warned them, don't assume that every sickness is caused because someone has sinned. Don't go that direction. Don't make that connection. It's true sometimes, but don't default to that. Common sins... There are some common sins that result in sickness. This, use your brain for just a second. Follow along with me. Think about uh, unresolved anger and bitterness. If I have that in my life, think about what my blood pressure is going to be like. You see, if, if I don't deal with that, it's going to cause health issues. Or what about, what if I'm, if I'm really a worrier? If I, if I have a lot of anxiety in my life, if, if, if I'm constantly thinking about the, the negative things that could happen in life. Oh, think about the stomach acid that builds up. You ever, you ever get indigestion or acid reflux whenever you worry a lot? Think about, think about what happens to your immune system when you worry. Your immune system is depleted. My wife, when she worries, her back tenses up. And it causes a lot of pain in her neck. You see, the worry is a sin. Worry is unbelief. And whenever we want to take that role of trying to control life circumstances that's not meant for us to take on, what happens? It affects our health. Think about how a child's rebellion can affect your health. Think about how a child's rebellion can affect the child's health. Think about the addictions in life. Oh, here's one. I got a good one. Personally, probably deal with it myself. Gluttony. Right? You can't, I have to remind myself, Jason, you can't take that half gallon of Blue Bell ice cream and eat it at once. That's gluttony. You're, you're going to be obese. You're going to be more obese. Let me straight that out. You're going to be more obese. 
mean, think about diabetes. Think about high blood pressure, pulmonary and cardiac diseases and illnesses that come out of gluttony. Think about the sin of materialism. What happens to your health if you go into debt? What happens to your health if, if you've, you've got all these things hanging out there that you have to take care of financially and the stress and the pressure weighing down on you because you had to have that shiny new barbecue grill? I'm not talking about anybody in particular. Oh, I want it. I look at it all the time. What you need to know is there are illnesses that are rooted in unhealthy and ungodly lifestyle patterns. You, you've got to be aware of that. God often uses these illnesses to get our attention and to draw us back to Him so that major changes can take place in our life. Ultimately, He wants to improve our relationship with Him. And He'll use those illnesses out of our sin in order to draw us back. It's important to pray and examine whether any sin has caused sickness. So, go back to my question. Can Christians expect the prayer of the elders when that happens, can they expect physical healing? I think, it's, I think they can if it's this type of illness. He says, such a prayer offered in faith. Or he says, are any of you sick? You should call for the elders to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and make you well. Look at the next clause or the next sentence. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I, I see this as that illness that has been brought on by a sinful lifestyle. And this person has called for the elders to come. They've made confession. They've confessed their sins within the body of believers. They've repented of that sinful behavior. The church is praying for them. And then they're on the road to recovery. I, I'm no theologian. I haven't written any commentaries. That's what I see though. So it's important for us to pray and examine if our illness... Is, is the result of any sin in our life. And then once we confess that to our brothers and sisters within the body, the body needs to continuously intercede on our behalf, offering up prayers so that healing can take place. So this is the next part of authentic faith I want you to see. Authentic faith expresses itself by intercession and confession. As a community of believers, we need to be confessing to one another. We need to be praying for one another. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? To see that the Bible recommends that you belong to a community of believers and that you're actively participating in confessing your sins to one another? You, I mean, everybody's going, I don't want to air my dirty laundry. Why is that? You know why? Because you probably don't trust the people you go to church with. What does that say about that body of believers? Don't worry about whether or not you can trust people within the church. Here's what you need to worry about. Worry about, am I the type of person that someone would consider and trust to confess to? If not, you're part of the problem. You know, I long for the time that, that we can trust one another in this building with with any of life's circumstances, with anything that's going on, however embarrassing it may be, you know this is a place that I can come that's safe. That if I share my hurt, if I share my burden, I will not be judged, I will not be made fun of, but those people will intercede on my behalf. Oh, I long for that. And I'm sure you do too. That's how authentic faith expresses itself, through intercession and confession. Look at the last two verses here. I'm going to skip that part about Elijah. He uses, that, he uses the, the life of Elijah there just to bolster his argument that, that a, a godly person who prays can change things. We'll, I won't go into that. That's a, another sermon for another time. Look at verse 19. This kind of wraps up the whole thing. 
My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. This is the final characteristic of faith that lasts. Look out for one another. Sometimes Christians, and, and I think a lot of us raise our hand and say, I can attest to this, I'm proof. But sometimes Christians stray away from the faith. Now, I'm not saying this isn't a loss of salvation. This is where you, you just drift away from the church. You drift away from God's people. You drift away from, from your commune, communion with the Lord. You know, we just get enticed by the trappings of this world. And, and as, we, as we chase after one, we drift further and further away from that pure and alterated faith where we're communing daily with God the Father. And, and, it's, and it's like shinies, and we're chasing the shinies, and before long we look up, and where we, the, the origination point is several miles away. We can't even... I, I read a story this week about a lady who broke down on the side of the road, ran out of gas, and she got out of her car and just took off through the woods. Eight days later, they found her, laying beside a, beside a creek. She was alive. All was good. She had went to find gas. Now why? But as the further and further she went from that highway, that roadway where people are traveling, she, the further and further she got lost. That's true of us as well. When you depart from that which you know to be truth, the highway, you'll get further and further away. You'll just be lost. In churches are communities of faith. God intends us to spur one another on in obedience. The church, God uses us as part of the process of, of accomplishing the task of eternal security. Now, we don't save, but we are part of the process where, where we actively go out and God uses us to keep His children faithful. We love one another. We encourage one another. We, we create safe spaces where we can confess to one another. We're to look out for one another and to help one another keep away from sin. That's what we're to do. That's what authentic faith does. I, I read a story this week about a young man who was talking about the time in his life where he drifted away from the Lord. And he talked about how he felt as if he was being pulled further and further out to sea. Have you ever been out in the ocean and had some of those rip tides pull you out? That's what this young man was talking about. He said, I got out there and it just, just felt like I was just being sucked out to sea. I continued to chase things that I knew I shouldn't be chasing. And I looked back and the shore was so far away and all I could see were other fellow believers, people of the church. And those people of the church were content to watch from the shoreline as I drifted further away. And all they would do was hurl accusations and condemn me with insults. They said, I'm thankful that I had a friend in that church. One Christian brother actually left the shoreline, waded out in the water, and came swimming out with a life raft. And he put that vest on me. And he was dragging me back in like a lifeguard. And he said, have you ever seen, they, they teach lifeguards whenever you're saving somebody. But the person being saved often fights you because they can't breathe and they're scared. So he said, I was fighting my, my rescuer tooth and nail, making it very difficult for him to bring me back in. At times, there were times that I thought I was going to drown the both of us. He said, but this young man fought again. The, 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 the pull down, the rescuer put a life jacket on him and eventually brought him back in. He refused to let him go. That's the last thing about authentic faith within a community. Authentic faith protects and rescues those who drift away. 
So, out of all this, I hope you see that people of authentic faith live in community. Don't neglect living out your faith among a, a body of believers as a committed participant. Be a part of a church. It might be this church. But find a church that you can call home and get involved. Be humble. Serve one another and share life. That's what authentic faith looks like. Let's pray.